Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Oh, is that, can you just see the, the PowerPoint? Is that what you can see on the screen? Yeah, I think it is. So, hi, so um, my name's Michael Hancock. I'm living down in Poole in Dorset. Um, I've, my interest in, in, in sort of neighbourhood democracy um, sort of really sort of kicked off when um, I was introduced to the idea of flat pack democracy. Um, we had somebody come along to a, an event that I run locally called Pool Soup, which is a crowdfunding event, which is about funding ideas in the neighbourhood and the local community. So, um, and she pitched and she won the pot of money at the end of the night. So um, I then, as a result of that, followed that up and, and got involved with, with Fizz on it and became interested in it. Um, and lo and behold, if you'd asked me sort of, you know, six months prior to this, you know, was I ever going to get involved in politics? I wouldn't, it wouldn't even enter my head. Um, and then yet, in, in sort of 2019, I find myself co-founding um, Alliance for Local Living as a political party in order to support independent candidates across uh, our local area. Um, the predominantly the the, some of the advantages of, of having a political party seem to be around having a logo on the ballot paper. Um, and then there's certain things around allocation to subcommittees that happens at a unitary level anyway. So those are some of the reasons why, you know, actually, you know, giving some effort into creating a political party, even though you're trying to promote the idea of being independent. Um, but obviously with flat pack, it's about trying to really get into the nuts and bolts about how you make decisions and changing the way that you you come about those decisions with perhaps more engagement and, and so that so it's for me it's more about changing the way you do things rather than the what which is the normal thing that you get on those manifestos is what we're going to do rather than how we're going to change the way that we, we do things so that's really what inspires me um, and again so I stood for election in 2019 um, I was about 300 seats, uh, sorry, votes short of, of, of getting a place. Um, so it came quite close. Um, and one of the things that I made as um, a, a manifesto pledge, if you like, standing as independent was actually to, to look at establishing a, a neighborhood council. Um, what did I notice when I was talking about that? Well, um, that neighbourhood was something that people felt that they can identify with. Um, community as a word and as a concept seemed a little bit too large for a lot of people. Um, and certainly where, where we are, where um, three towns were coming together, that's actually you know, a community of 400,000 people. So sort of outside of people's ability to kind of understand what, you know, obviously people understand the figure, but you know, to, to be able to feel that they connect with. Um, that people didn't feel that they were being listened to um, and that there was a real desire for people to participate in decisions and also the co-design of solutions as well. And then participatory budgeting sort of came up, um, you know, particularly when you're sort of talking about um, tax. So just to be clear on where we are um, or where I am in Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, we actually had three unitary authorities that merged into one to form a sort of a pseudo city region council. Um, and so there was a real movement from even what you might call, call um, you know, even though were big towns, you know, a set of sense that it had moved up a level. And so that there was a sense that there was a real lack of having anything else like the parish councils. So in, in Bournemouth and Poole, we don't have any um, parish or community councils. Um, Christchurch in their negotiation for this remerger and things, um, they, they sort of negotiated as, as part of their coming into this that they would have them. So Christchurch um, has them, but in Bournemouth and Paul we don't. So I guess one of the questions for me is, you know, what, what is a neighbourhood area? You know, is it 5,000 people? I know there's quite a few people talk about that 5,000 fig figure as being a sort of a something that people can feel that they connect with and, um, and so on. Is it a ward? Is it four wards? Um, the area that I'm showing on that screen there is, is um, what I'm currently working towards, or there's a couple of examples here. One of this is about 
you know, the sort of, sort of discussion we've had locally about what a neighborhood council area might look like. Um, and that's another example, slightly different area. So we're, we're starting to have those conversations about what areas look like. Uh, but of course, when you're actually creating one, um, defining the area is the sort of starting point, although it, it, it might be something that's, it, you know, ought to be happening later on. You have to kind of define the area in order to start the process. Um, some different forms of organisations, obviously residents associations, traders associations, neighbourhood development trusts, um, neighbourhood forums, which is where you start to get into what people consider to be democracy, I guess, in the sense that they are, you know, voted upon and, and there's a referendum um, in, involved. And obviously there, a lot of people consider neighbourhood forums as being the vehicle for creating a neighbourhood plan. Um, but obviously neighbourhood plans tend to have a quite a physical connection to them. And I think there's a great missed opportunity for neighbourhood plans that actually look at the that look at the the social justice element rather than the physicality of a place um, and its planning. And then of course you've got neighbourhood councils or aka parish councils. Um, and they can be created um, through a governance review. So in, in our particular case, uh, where we are, where we don't have neighbourhood councils or parish councils, the governance review is a mechanism by which we can actually get one. Um, and then that can either be triggered by 7% of the population in the area calling for a governance review, or it can be called by the local authority and the councillors in the local authority to undertake one. Um, we were quite hopeful that that would have occurred here in Bournemouth and Poole and Christchurch, um, but uh, a little bit of a political shake-up meant that that uh, didn't happen. So it's left back now to, you know, local people to decide whether or not they want to do that. So the outcome of that governance review then puts forward the proposal that one is created uh, or, or some other solution and then you've got a referendum and obviously 50% of the people in that referendum plus need to vote in favour was obviously with a 30% turnout as an average sort of turnout for, for voting um, that's about 15% of the population. Um, obviously one of the main barriers to people considering a neighbourhood council is this idea of extra taxation um, but when I've been exploring that with people and you say, well, actually, you know, we want to put that, the majority of that up for uh, participating budgeting and people being able to vote for that, that's where people's minds start to go and you kind of get, uh, well, certainly in the conversations I've had. So how would we like to do things differently um, if we've got a neighbourhood council or we're, we're planning to have one or, or we've got one that already exists and we want to try and way, ways of changing it? What, what, what do we want to do differently? Um, so, so I'm speaking from my own perspective here on what inspires me with some ideas. Um, so the concept called the, the children's fire is one of those. And that's really a sense that you, you take the, the, the future of the children and you know, look seven generations into the future and, and really make a pledge to one another that nothing that you will do and make a decision on Will, will have harm for the future. Um, and there's a great uh, inspirational talk about that um, by a guy called Mac McCartney, who runs something called Ember Coon. Um, another thing that inspires me is something called Way of Council. Um, it sort of comes from the sort of old tribal traditions of people sitting around a fire and how they would come and make decisions. And um, it's also used a lot in, in some cases for um, sort of um, therapeutic work as well in circle work. Um, so, you know, really getting a sense of it, really what it's about is getting people just out of their heads and, and more speaking directly from their heart and, and really getting to the, to, the, to the nuts and bolts of that. Um, when it comes to forming projects and ideas, dragon dreaming is another tool and, uh, that I'm quite, quite interested in. Sociocracy is another. Um, asset-based community development. I think that's really important and something that I'm really, really keen on. Um, communication, non-violent communication, and there's another, another sort of thing called clean language. Again, those are different 
different ways of communicating. Um, I think they have a really important part to play in all of this. Um, citizens' assemblies are things that inspire me. Um, I've recently engaged with a um, village in the city and, and I'm actually using villages in the city as an idea to kind of start to build that community awareness around what it might be to collaborate in a, in a local neighborhood um, and to get some interest going. Um, so that's been really, really helpful and useful actually getting started with something. Um, poverty, uh, poverty Truth Commission, that kind of concept where you get people who have lived experience of the thing that you're trying to, to solve, actually being part of the decision making and the, and the creation of, of the solution. I think that's really critically important. And there's lots that I've forgotten. No, 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 not, 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 uh, not, not forgetting. Obviously, we're here in the context of the neighbourhood democracy um, movement. So you know that that's also inspiring me. But I'm sure there's things that I've uh, forgotten about and yet, things yet to discover that that are also interesting to me. So I guess also what I'm interested in thinking about is you know what is the role of a councillor in 2021? You know, are is it about actually you know making decisions on behalf of people or is it more about becoming that community builder and that facilitator um you know obviously with what susan's been doing about using the the platform there about so it's a bit more about facilitating the community as opposed to sort of making decisions on behalf of it obviously that's from a legal and governance point of view that's kind of what it's set up to do but actually is that's what we need is it more about community building and facilitation and what does that mean um and then you know is is it what does it was it like to have a fit for purpose governance structure um you know uh, neighborhood councils have a constitution although that's very simple uh, but then the the more detailed document is something called standing orders um you know uh, and some of that needs to be kept uh, because it, otherwise you can't have a council that doesn't relate to the to, to the government and it won't be acknowledged but obviously so what what is it that you absolutely must have and then how do we how do we then you know look at building out perhaps new standing orders that kind of reflect what's needed um and then it's about you know what 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 changes in the way that engagement happens and that communication with the people in the neighborhood happens and how does all that work um so i'm kind of on a bit of a journey um, I'm kind of thinking that our little neighbourhood in Parkstone could be a, an interesting kind of experiment in terms of uh, because we're in the situation where we, we don't have a, a neighbourhood or parish council. So, you know, if we're, we're asking for one, we can we can largely create one from from scratch and they're not everywhere I can do that. Um, but we're in that unique position. So I'm really, really fascinated and interesting to, to hear from people as to what they think that we need to be doing differently. Um, and and yeah, so that's that's all I've got to say for now. And hopefully that's sort of stimulated. I mean, if we wanted a little bit more time, we could you know, watch a video or two from some of those uh, inspiring ideas, but I don't want to sort of drag it and make it too long. So I'm happy for the people to kind of let me go. So I hope that's been really helpful, Angela. Yeah, that's been really helpful. And, and I, I'm wondering, is the question that you're inviting people to do is who else wants to work alongside you on this and explore what might be possible? Yeah, so I'm, I'm I guess with community alliances and, and in general, I'm interested in creating things that could be useful for other people elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, I wonder what, creating a, a new model um, that we pilot here in Parkstone um, and then you know get to share with the rest of the country and um, to kind of you know give people a bit of a you know a uh, bit of a bit of a new model um, so I'm very interested in, in collaborating with lots of people all over the place who want to sort of um, do a similar thing where they are. Um, obviously, if if there are people living in places where there's parish councils already in existence, it becomes more challenging. But um, not not 
impossible um um because obviously you know but when you're creating something from scratch um then i think that's where we've got an advantage to to start something where we are because we don't have one so we have that advantage yeah 